10 through 13, which is a part of the, of the model prayer in which Jesus uh, was explaining to his, uh, his disciples how to pray. Yes. And basically prayed like this, or prayed thus to Thy kingdom come. Thy will, this is Matthew 6, 10 through 13. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. One thing the Savior understood is that ultimately, eventually, God's will will rule in heaven and in earth. So you can bump up against what God says. You can try to resist what God says. But ultimately, his kingdom, his rule will govern at the end. Then he says, give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Then he said, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine, for God, for your, you are the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Yeah. I like that. That's the doxology. That's the last part of that verse. That's the part that, uh, that we have, uh, have borrowed for our theme. And we need to understand that this glorious, it's powerful, it's the kingdom of God, it is the church of God, it is the church of Christ that we are talking about. Amen. And we ought to be proud to be members and participants in that kingdom. Amen. We ought not to be shamed. Right. And I uh, chose another verse of scripture from, Matthew, from Mark chapter 9, mm -hmm. verses 1 through 8. You can turn over there. I don't know if it's on the board, but it is. It? And he said unto them, He said unto them, Verily I say unto you, Verily I say unto you, that there be some of them that stand here, some of you that stand here, which shall not taste of death, that will not taste of death until you have You know, a lot of folk think that the kingdom can come whenever they get ready. <laughs> that the kingdom is coming in 606, according to the Catholic Church. The kingdom came in, in some other part. But he said, there's some of you human beings standing right here at that moment that will not die before the kingdom come with power. Now, that, this is a very interesting uh, uh, verse because it really does not have anything to do with the next context. We'll talk a little bit about that. Verse 2 says, and after six days, after six days, Jesus taking them with Peter and James uh -huh. and John and leading them up into the high mountain, uh -huh. apart from themselves. Apart by themselves. And he was transfigured before them. He was transfigured before them. And his raiment became shiny, shiny, exceedingly white as snow, white as snow, so as no fuller on earth can wipe them. Now, 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 I looked at that. No fuller on earth can wipe it. That's why sometimes the King James gets a little misunderstanding. But basically, there is no bleach, there's no oxy, whatever, or anything that can make a person's raiment as white as what Jesus transfigured into. I don't care what you got, what you working with, what concoction that you are brightening your clothes with, or whatever doing a lightning and whitening and brightening the teeth or whatever. It doesn't really matter. He said there was nothing on earth that could make something that might not tell you something amazing. Yeah. That's got to be amazing by itself. Right. Verse number four. And there appeared unto them Elias with Moses, and they were talking with Jesus. Now this is very important right. to those that were Hebrews and Jews. Elias and Moses and prophets, they were the key to uh, the, 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 the obedience and the law. And it was important to a certain extent that they saw these great, iconic, biblical figures standing with Jesus to let them know that Jesus was not just some uh, 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 person that's kind of stumbled onto the scene. But he's standing there with deity 
as far as religion was concerned. And so by all three of them standing together, that was amazing. Here, the prophets that they had not seen before, but had heard about the great uh, 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 historical figures were standing there with their friend, the carpenter's son, at the same time. There they uh, appeared with him. Verse 5. And Peter answered and said to Jesus. And Peter answered and said to Jesus. Master. Master. It is good for us to be here. It is good for us to be here. And let us make three tabernacles. Let's make three tabernacles. One for thee. One for thee. One for Moses. One for Moses. And one for Elias. One for Elias. Now, 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 I can understand. Okay, we got these three figures. Yeah. These three important people. Yeah. Right here. Let's, let's, let's do some monument. And you know how monuments are. If you've ever been through Gettysburg, uh, or the great battlefield is, there's a monument there. Right. And we have monuments for everything that we want. It helps us remember the importance of the situation, right. especially uh, uh, military and especially other aspects, and even presidential and whatever they are. we got monuments, and they represent the importance of what that person or that thing did or whatever took place. Right. So let's do something here. You got Jesus, yeah. you got Elias, yeah. you got you got Moses. Yeah. We not we ought to mark this yes. with some kind of significance. Yeah. And what does the Bible say? For he wished not what to say. He For he was so afraid. But this is the problem. He didn't know what to say. Uh -huh. And sometimes to say the first thing to come to your mouth is the wrong thing to say. I didn't know what to say, so I said this. What does that mean? He said he did not know what to say. And because he was afraid. Now look, he saw somebody transfigured so white that he couldn't even get it clean with any stones or brook or whatever. And he saw all of these old dead characters come together. And so he began to how mumble out, let's build a monument, because he didn't know what to say. <laughs> and sometimes when you stand before God, you need to just be quiet. Yeah. Yeah. Just be quiet. Yeah. And let God do what God is going to do. He don't need you to put your two cents in. Yeah. Yeah. And so, you know what? God had to come in and insert some understanding. Verse number seven. And there was a cloud that overshadowed them. A cloud was overshadowed them. And a voice came out of the cloud saying. A voice came out of the cloud saying. Now this is significant as well. Because when you understand anything about God in the Old Testament, I think Brother Moore would testify to this, when they were in the wilderness, God was represented by a cloud in the day and fire at night. Is that right? So here he comes again during this day, or whatever this time was, as a cloud. Cloud overshadowed them. And a voice came out of the cloud saying what? This is my beloved son. This is my beloved son. Hear him. Basically, you need to be quiet. You need to, you need to shut your mouth. You don't know what to say. You're scared to death. Let Jesus talk. Yes. Now, he got the attention with that, I'm sure. Cloud <laughs> come over them. And all of that that went on. Said, hey, this is my beloved son. Mm -hmm. Hear him. Mm -hmm. In verse 8. And suddenly, when they had looked round about, when they, they saw back, yeah. they saw no man anymore. That's what I want to say. Man made things not gonna matter. Right. When they looked back, yeah. there was no Elias. Mm -hmm. There was no Moses. Yeah. Right. Yeah. There was only Jesus. Yeah. Right. And when we take our mind and focus off of Jesus, we have lost the identity of the kingdom. When we start looking at other things, and when you look at all these denominations created by men and women and other things for other reasons, they've already taken their focus off of Christ. And there's something wrong with that. Gee, God does not appreciate it. He didn't like it then. And why would he put up with it now? Regardless of how good they are. I'm not going to argue with you. 
Elias was probably a good person. Moses, probably a great person. But yet, God said, hear Jesus. And I want to say to some of these other folk who have created denominational error, they were good people. But they do not, but they are not Jesus. When you go back to verse number one, you see the phrase, and he said unto them, and he uh, went on to say, uh, Verily some would not taste of death till they have seen the kingdom of God come with power. Right. Now, this sentence seems to be out of context to what is what follows or precedes it, talking about the transfiguration of Christ. <coughs> and we have to remember that the New Testament was, was a written letter. It was not divided into chapters and verses as we have it now. That was done for our benefit. Yes. You don't write a letter to about chapter 1 and stop and say chapter 2. You don't just write a letter. Yes. If someone else comes through, we put the chapters and the verses to it. And really this particular verse belongs to the preceding thought that was discussed. And so we understand that each book is they try to do a continuous article without any praise. But sometimes they might make a mistake. But when you look at Mark chapter 8, 34 to 38, then you attach that next verse, it makes a little bit more sense. And here it says that he called the people unto him with his disciples also. You can keep reading. You can see there. Mark 8, 30 to 34. That should have been right above that. Yeah. Okay, and we had called the people unto him, uh -huh. with his disciples also, he said unto them, uh -huh. Whosoever will come after me, yeah. let him deny himself, and, do what? and take up his cross, and, and follow me. Okay. <laughs> if you want to come to me, there are some things you got to do. You're going to have to deny yourself, make sacrifices, both monetarily, personally, time. So when we actually do stuff around here, we're only doing what Jesus said. If you want to follow him, make the necessary adjustments to follow him. He said, yeah, if you want to follow me, then you're going to have to deny yourself. Verse 35. For whosoever will save his life, if you want to save, protect your life, shall lose it. You're going to lose it. But whosoever shall what? Shall lose his life. For who? For my sake. And? And the gospel, the same shall save it. If you're going to try to protect your life, uh -huh. and going to try to keep it so perfect or whatever, and all that, you're going to lose your life ultimately in the end. But if you are willing uh, to, to give up your life for Jesus yeah. and the promotion of the gospel, then you're going to gain something. Yeah. You're going to gain something. Verse 36. For what shall it come to man? What shall it come to man? He shall gain the whole world. What if you gain the whole world? And lose his own soul. I understand about acquisition. Whether it be money, property, the prestige, authority. We kind of like that. There's nothing wrong with being the best of what you do. But we got to understand it should be put in perspective Amen. when it comes to doing stuff for God. For doing things for God. So if you gain the whole world yeah. and then you lose your soul, the only thing I say is this. If you don't want to live a Christian life, get out there and start living simply as soon as possible for as long as you can. Because uh, eternity is forever. Yeah. And you may, you're going to have hellfire. I'll tell you, if you don't know what that is, go to Death Valley. <laughs> you go to Death Valley and stand out there. It was so hot. It was so hot. We stopped there in Death Valley. And my daughter went into a store to, to get something to drink or whatever. When she came back out, she was trying to put something in the ice chest, and she was hopping around uh, like she was on some kind of fired up coal. Because uh, the, the shoes she had on were not protecting her feet from the heat. I mean, she did a hop and a dance, so I said, give me a rainstorm soap. <laughs> I said, what you wearing? 
<laughs> Sandals? No, no can do. <laughs> you could be wearing some straight out boots. <laughs> Not just steel toe, but still soles. <laughs> But you can't give it to me. <laughs> you can't take your money with you. You can't take your cash. But there's no need for you to waste your money and be frivolous. And when you die, you might as well have somebody to give it to. <laughs> because somebody going to take it. And I don't know what it is strangely about this, but when you start getting near death and getting sick, all the vultures start hanging around. <laughs> Folks you haven't seen in a while come around and ask, and they really under the, you got any insurance? <laughs> and you ask the question, they're concerned. <laughs> brother, do they have any insurance? Oh, do they have any money? I always wanted to see what they're gonna get out of the situation. But you can gain the whole world and lose your soul. Now that's when we start talking about the kingdom, we're talking about soul saving understanding about God. So what will a man give? Verse 37. Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? Okay, so what should you give in exchange? We have an exchange rate around here. So we give God cash, we get stuff. You know, sometimes you can trade things for, the, uh, for you know, I don't, they, don't, they don't do that so much anymore. You know, we used to get the green stamps and the blue chip stamps and then we could trade it for stuff that we wanted and all this kind of thing. But, 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 but we have to give something in order to get something. But when you start talking about a soul, what is the value, what is the market value of a soul? If you're going to sabotage yourself in the kingdom, what are you going to do it for? Pat on the back? A momentary good time? A drunken stupor? Huh? What are you willing to give up for your soul? Whosoever therefore, this is 38, shall be ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation. Of him shall the Son of Man be ashamed when we come in the glory of his Father with his holy angels. Now he's talking to disciples. He's basically saying there's going to come a time yeah. when you're going to be challenged. You're going to be challenged spiritually. Yeah. And if you are ashamed to stand up for me, yeah. if you're ashamed to speak for me, right. if you're ashamed to live for me, then you are going to be in a negative or a bad place spiritually. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. yeah. He says, for the Son of Man shall not should be ashamed when he comes to the glory of his Father. See, at some point, all of the trouble, all of the trials, all of the stress, everything we're going through is going to make some sense. Amen. It'll make sense during the judgment. It'll make sense when we go to the everlasting kingdom. And we have to be kind of ready for that. But some people... They are just going to be so disrespectful that they won't stand up for God. Let their friends and associates uh, uh, hinder them from worshiping and serving God. Let the, uh, the ladies and the other folks uh, destroy it for, just get them away from the church. Let money and, and jobs and whatever uh, get them away from church. You need to worry about that kind of thing. Turn please to Matthew 10. 32 and 33. Yeah. If the disciples are ashamed of Jesus, then the kingdom is corrupted from the inside out. Right. I'm telling you, if we're too ashamed to tell others about Christ, yeah. we're too ashamed that we might offend them if we tell them the church of Christ is right. We are too ashamed to make a stand and say there is a right way and a wrong way, then we ourselves are sabotaging the kingdom of God. Yeah. I'm telling you, I'm not worried about offending anybody. I'm not going to offend them anyway. I'm going to tell them the truth. And I'm going to go and say it's up to you now. The truth is still the truth. When I put the ball in your court, 
Yeah. I've told you everything you need to know. It's up to you to decide that's what you want to do. Right. That's what's up to you. Is that a, not going to twist your arm? If you want to really be that type of person in the kingdom of God that does and works and is growing and moving and not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, then you're going to have to stand up. And there's nothing you can do. Nobody can make you do it. You got to decide the church and the kingdom is worth more than my soul. It's worth more than anything I want to do for myself. Well, Matthew 10, verse 32. Yeah. Whosoever therefore shall confess me before men. If you confess me before men. Him will I confess also before <laughs> my Father, which is in heaven. I will exchange the favor. Uh, yeah. If you confess me before men, if you acknowledge me publicly here on earth, I will acknowledge you before my Father, which is in heaven. Amen. 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 Girl, Jesus will return the favor. Mm -hmm. Verse 33. But whosoever shall deny me before men, him will I also deny before my Father, which is in heaven. I'll return the favor. Mm -hmm. If you deny me yeah. before me, if you deny me before people on the earth, I'm going to deny you in front of my Father in heaven. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that's something we need to think about. The kingdom will come to and It's going to come with power. And it's clear that the individuals alive at that time <laughs> would be present when the kingdom would come into existence. Mm -hmm. We've already made the point. The church of Christ is the kingdom. Right. Some are not going to die until the kingdom come with power. The kingdom and the church are used interchangeably. Jesus said in Matthew 16 and verse number 18, yeah. in the dialogue begins around verse 13, that he would build his church. Yes. And the gates of hell would not prevail against it. Yes. And so we need to understand that. It's oftentimes the church is referred to as the kingdom of his dear son. Right. So the church has purpose today. Yeah. It's a house of believers. It has purpose. And I, 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 we have to kind of understand that the, per the church should be something special. The church is the people. Yeah. And it should be something special. And when I think about that, I go over to Ephesians 5, 25 through 27, right. where uh, Paul talking to the church at Ephesus uh, gives them some understanding yeah. about the church and talking about it in the form of a bride for Christ. Mm -hmm. yes. He starts off with the first phrase, husbands, yes, love your wives, yes, even as Christ loved the church and gave itself for you. Now we use this, we read a lot of weddings and stuff, let them know just how uh, passionate and how willing they should be willing to love their wives. Mm -hmm. To give their life, because Jesus gave his life for the church. Right. And he said he gave his life to the church, verse 26, that he might Thank sanctify yeah. and cleanse it yes, with the washing of water the by the word. Yes. Yes. You don't get into the church without an understanding from the words of God. Yes, but you don't get into the church until you're washed in the baptismal grave of, of baptism. Yes, Verse 27. That he might present it. Ultimately, he's going to present to himself a glorious church. A glorious yes, church. Yes. Not having a spot. Not having a spot. The church is something special. The church has a purpose. It's holy and sanctified. Verse number 26. It's holy because we are holy and we're supposed to be spiritual people. Sanctified, set apart from the world. That's us. My grandmother used to say, God don't make mess. And when it comes to the church in this kingdom, that's true. The church is not a mess and neither the kingdom. But many churches are a mess, so they lack God, and they lack the teaching, and that's why they're a mess. Yes, sir. Yes. Verse number 27, 
Yeah. So ought men to love, I'm sorry, that he might present it to himself. I present it to himself. A glory of church. Uh huh. Not having spot, nor wrinkle, or any such thing. The glory of the church of Christ. Mm -hmm. It's going to be glorious. Now, when you get a bride, I don't care what she looks yeah. like. Do you? Then when, it, when the man is looking at the bride coming down the aisle, she's a glorious bride. Uh -huh. It got nothing to do with what you think anyway. No, <laughs> so you're laughing for her. Because they're in the audience looking at you. They might be saying the same thing. You ain't nothing to look at either. Uh -huh. But when you made that commitment to be together, uh -huh. then that becomes a special situation. Yeah. The church is spotless. And that spotless is the cleansing aspect. The power of the church of Christ. That's why we read the transfiguration. Jesus can shine in just like a white, wider than anything we could get. Because he's showing you the spotless nature of himself that will then be transformed to the church. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. Yes. That's the power of the church of Christ. Mm -hmm. The church has a value today. It has some value, huh? I'm going to stop a little bit because I've been driving, so I'm a little tired. Okay. The church has value. Yes, Come on. Value. The value is when you regard something to be held to deserve the importance, worth, or usefulness of something. Yeah. When you think that something is valuable, is valuable. And I, I, I say that, that you see some people that hold on to stuff. Mm -hmm. And when you look at it, you're saying, there ain't nothing but trash. Yeah. Uh -huh. But to that person, yeah. they have placed some value, yeah. sentimental, or whatever it is. Yes. It, it doesn't have to be actually financial, but it could be, whatever it is. They, it, to them, it means something. Yeah. Well, the church ought to have some value. And you ought to place some value upon it. Mm -hmm. Considering it to be important and, and, and beneficial. Right. You ought to have a high opinion of the church. Right. The church is valuable today because the church represents the love, the kindness, and the togetherness that God wants for his people. Right. Turn to Ephesians 4, 31 through 32. We'll read a little of that. Yeah. Yes, Ephesians 4, 31 through 32. Let all bitterness. Let all bitterness. And wrath. Wrath. And anger. Mm -hmm. And clamor. Uh -huh. And evil speaking. Uh -huh. Be put away from you. Put, away, put it away from you. Yeah. 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 I mean, there's no place for that. Yeah. There's no place for bitterness, rage, anger, harsh words, slanderous words. Religious behavior, there's no place for that in the kingdom. There's no place for that in the kingdom. There's no place for that in the church. Instead, what does it say? And be kind one to another. Be kind one to another. The church ought to be kind. There ought not be a person here to say, I was offended by somebody here. And when somebody's doing that, we need to stop them. And say, that's not, that's not what the kingdom is all about. I heard a story, and it made me continue to think. There was this church, and they hired a new minister, and they were going to present the new minister to the congregation. It was a large congregation. It was like 7,000 people. And they had not seen a new minister. I guess they had a board that hired him, I guess. And so he came to the church the next day, and he was going to be presented to the congregation. But he came dressed as a poor person. Smart. He came dressed as a poor person. And when he came in, he kind of milled around and folks didn't want to be near him. Folks looked at him crazy. They looked at him and stared him down. And he asked a few for some change. And he was denied. He asked for some of the different things, food, where they wouldn't give him nothing. So then he went on, he made the one mistake, he came on down and sat on the front row. And some good natured Christian came by and told him, uh, you need to move to the back. <laughs> and move this bum, uh, so-called bum, to the back. So then when they sing in and doing everything, the leadership team gets up and says, we want to present our minister to, to you, Mr. whatever his name was. And the bum jumped up and started walking down the aisle. 
wow, folks started to say, what, what's that bum? Somebody said, get, get that bum. <laughs> that bum was getting out of control. He started to walk through the church building during the service. He walked right on down up to the, up to the stage, and he said, he began to say, when I was hungry, you did not feed. When I was naked, he started talk, talking to the, the scripture. Yeah. And afterwards, we kind of found out that the leadership knew he was going to do this. Yeah. And then he went on to say, I was, this is how I was treated. And then he closed the service and they said, come back next week. So a lot of folks were crying and weeping because they had judged the person and they had made the person feel bad. Yeah. That's not what the church is about. Right. Right. We don't know their circumstances. Maybe they do smell. Maybe they do look bad. Maybe there's a problem. Maybe we should keep an eye on them. But let's not disrespect them when they come to the worship service. Yeah. Yeah. Kindness. Yeah. Kindness. Verse number 32, what does it say? Instead, be kind one to another. Be kind All your wrongdoings, everything you've done, has been thrown upon God. Right. And God's forgave you. Right. How come you can't forgive somebody? Yeah. Yeah. How come you can't forgive somebody? Yeah. And that man stepped on my foot. Yeah, he did. Maybe he made it by accident. He talked about me. He had no business. He looked at me crazy. Like I said before, you, if a person looks at me crazy, I'm going to look at them crazy. <laughs> <laughs> what? 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 I, mean, I mean, it doesn't help anything to be eyeballing folk crazy. What? What you, what you want? I mean, who cares about that? Now, uh, he looks at me crazy while he would look back at what? What? what, what, what? I mean, it doesn't make any sense to treat folk improperly. It doesn't make any sense. when people are going to get up sick. Amen. Don't feel like 100%. Amen. Hurt in some kind of way. Yeah. And they're going to say some things they, ain't got, they don't have any business saying. They might act a little strange. You don't even know what they're going through. Yes, sir. Right. Give them a break. Yes, sir. Right. The kingdom is about love. Right. The kingdom is about kindness. Right. The kingdom is about doing uh, things that are right. It's about being together. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And all I know is that if we respect each other in the church, then we can do some work here for the kingdom of God. That's enough for the day. I, I, I'll come on back next week and I'll get my, as Brother Lou said, get my sea legs together. I'll come on back a little longer for you next week. But I tell you, oh, wait a second, brother. I ain't been there. I ain't been there. I just gotta speak another hour. I'm gonna forget that brother. I ain't gonna look at him there. I ain't gonna stare with the with the red sock off. I'm gonna love him anyway. That's how we gotta do it here in the church. That's how we gotta do it because you know what? Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it's in heaven. Nothing, you're not gonna stop it. You can't stop Jesus from coming back again. You can't stop him from from having judgment on those that live right and to put those who live wrong in a bad place. You can't stop that. All you can do is teach folk and educate them about the Word of God and then wash them by baptizing them into the, into the water of the grave of baptism. Because Jesus is going to build his church. He's already established it because then when we read today, there were those there that would not taste death until the kingdom came with power. Yes. And when you go to Acts 2 and read verse Acts 1, he said, just like Jesus said, yes. this was the day. Yeah. This was the moment. We're going to talk about that another, another Sunday. You know, the day, this is the day, this is the time that the kingdom came. And on that day when they preached that first gospel sermon, 3,000 souls were saved. Some few days later, another 5,000 were added to the church. And they said, if you read the, the uh, Acts the second chapter about verse 47, God had them. Yes. They weren't voted on, they weren't elected, they didn't have to stand before no governing board, no people had to say, God added them to the church. Right. Why? Because they heard the word yeah. of Jesus. Yeah. They heard the gospel. 
gospel, 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4. They heard it and they believed it. In Acts 2, verse 37, they said, men and brethren, what shall we do? And in verse 38, it said, repent and be baptized. In their case, they repented of the sins they had done. Those that quickly killed and assaulted Jesus, they had to repent of those sins. And then be baptized, by baptized. Romans 6, and I think about verses 3 and 4. You're buried with him in the baptism, and you're raised with him. You simulate his death, burial, and resurrection in baptism. That's why you're immersed. Amen. That's why we don't sprinkle. Amen. Baptism is significant. Amen. You simulate the, the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. And that baptism still saved then. And 1 Peter 3, 20 and 21, it still saves now. Amen. And that's what we're talking about, getting into the church of Christ. Yeah. That places you in the church. So, think about it. Yeah. If you haven't been living right and maybe you just want to get yourself together, come on down. If you need prayer, come on down. If you need to be baptized, we do that. If you need more teaching, we'll teach you. Yes, sir. Remember, there is a, there is a kingdom of God. And we're trying to get those individuals to be a part of it. What's the invitation? Prepare to meet thy God. I'm going to sing just a couple of verses. Prepare to meet thy God as he understands the same.